Welcome, everyone. We are happy to uh, welcome Rose Roach to present to us. Rose is the National Coordinator for the Labor Campaign for Single Payer and serves as the Chair of Healthcare for All Minnesota. And Rose retired in January 2023 after 34 years in the labor movement, most recently serving as the Executive Director for the Minnesota Nurses Association. So please take it away, Rose. Well, thank you, Jerry. Um, and good evening, union siblings, healthcare justice activists, and fellow patients. Um, I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to talk with you about the corporatization of healthcare and how that corporatization has manifested itself to put patient health and provider care at risk. If we learned nothing else from the horrors of the COVID-19 pandemic, we certainly learned that health is indeed a public good, not a consumable good, and the insulting question of who deserves health care was definitively answered once and for all. We all do, because we're human and it's just that simple. So I want to begin, though, at the beginning. We're going to talk a little bit about the overall impact of privatization, specifically later on uh, on Medicare, uh, the Medicare fund through Medicare Advantage. But let's begin with how did we get here in the first place? It's really important to understand how we got here, how managed care, meaning the privatization of our healthcare system, has hogged the spotlight of healthcare reform. What that looks like and how it's impacting our ability to make change that would actually put patients over profits. The focus of our system for the last 50 years has been on incremental market-driven solutions that don't work. And they don't work because we insist on trying to treat healthcare like a commodity. Yet this failed ideology continues to permeate the healthcare reform debate when the reality is it's the prices that drive cost, not quantity. These failed market solutions are known as managed care. They don't manage care, however, they manage money. It is our clinical care providers that manage our care. Many health economists hold to the idea that excessive health care costs in the United States are due to two things, physician greed and patients getting too much care. The fee-for-service model, which just simply means paying a fee for each service that's provided, these economists claim, incentivizes volume. Well, that claim is not evidence-based and it is incredibly insulting to our healthcare professionals. It's managed care that has brought us networks, deductibles, co-pays, co-insurance, under-insurance, prior authorizations, and forcing us to choose between a whole pill or a half a pill. Business strategies, not healthcare strategies, are what are being used and that's a problem. Studies demonstrate that it is indeed the price that drives costs, not quantity, as you can see from these two prominent publications. Health Affairs, as far back as 2003, stated, the United States spends more on health care than any of the other OECD countries spend without providing more services than other countries do. This suggests that the difference in spending is mostly attributable to higher prices of goods and services. And 11 years later in 2014, The Lancet wrote, prices rather than volume of health services contribute the most to explaining the higher U.S. spending, making it clear that nothing has changed. And I can guarantee you 10 years later, it still isn't any different. Of course, administrative waste adds to these costs. I mean, how backwards is this particular graph? A 3,000% increase in administrators, administrators in our system between 1970 and 2019, with only about a 100% increase in physicians entering the healthcare field. This pretty much tells us everything we need to know about the problem with this system. And the impact of all those administrators is high and unnecessary administrative costs. 34 cents on the dollar, not going to health care. Managed care has done none of what it has promised to do. It's failed to contain costs, increase quality, or decrease health disparities. It is time for us to stop this waste and start focusing on true freedom for patients and for providers. 
Privatization has resulted in some industry trends that I want to point out because I think it's really important to understand the impact that this privatization is having on us as patients, as well as the providers who are giving us our care. Um, they range from hospital at home, also known as home all alone, lean management model, consolidation and merger, and the creation thereby of healthcare deserts. Home All Alone is aimed at keeping patients needing acute care out of the hospital. Instead of admitting these patients who would otherwise be traditionally hospitalized, they are sent home with an iPad and a smartwatch to be admitted for hospital care at their home. The patient is told a team of medical professionals will monitor them remotely from a medical hub. These hubs could be many miles away or even in a different state from the patient themselves. From the hub care teams, um, they are sent out to check on the patient as the need arises. In cases where a provider needs to physically be with the patient, the remote team will then send out a nurse or what they are calling an upskilled paramedic. These home all alone schemes were born of an unholy alliance between a profit-driven hospital industry, technology giants, and venture capitalists seeking to re reap profits by replacing hands-on skilled hospital care with robots, gadgets, and less skilled contract workers. This is dangerous. Families often don't realize how cumbersome and difficult patient care is, even when it is relatively simple. Data collected since the start of the pandemic shows clearly that women, and especially single mothers, suffer economic losses as their caregiving tasks increase. It's easy to see how calling on families to care for loved ones who need hospitalization will lead to a disproportionate increase in economic losses for women. Nurses know the idea that family members can provide hospital-level care is absurd and unsafe. Registered nurses often serve as the last line of defense for patients against medical errors, especially in the area of medication uh, administration. Nurses are shocked by the non-existent safety protocols for these home all alone programs. Private advantage plans, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, are at the tip of the AI, artificial intelligence, algorithm iceberg as they're using artificial intelligence to systematically deny, deny skilled nursing care to elderly patients with serious health problems, according to senior advocates and two class action lawsuits that have been filed. A local Twin Cities, Minnesota news channel, CARE 11, did an investigative report recently about this very issue. You see pictured here a gentleman named Bill Draxler. Mr. Draxler was 96 years old when he broke his hip. After spending five days hospitalized, his doctors prescribed skilled nursing care to help him recover and regain strength and mobility. Well, the artificial intelligence algorithm for his advantage plan used uh, that was used predicted that Bill only really needed 17 days to fully recover from his hip replacement surgery. However, his medical records told a very different story, showing how much care Bill still needed. As the 18th day approached, Bill's medical team informed the Advantage Plan company that he still needed maximal assistance just to stand up. He, they also told uh, the Advantage Plan company that his self-care performance score was zero out of 12. Of course, you can appeal such decisions uh, when they issue these, um, but they are lengthy and purposely confusing, so many people just give up. This company told Bill's family, you have two choices. Either leave Bill at the uh, care facility and pay all of the costs out of pocket or take him home and figure out how to provide the care yourselves. Even though those appeal processes can be lengthy and sometimes confusing, it is important to engage in them because most of the time, far more times than not, when people do appeal, they will actually win those appeals. And that is because nearly all of the claims that are denied by Medicare Advantage plans would have actually been covered by traditional Medicare. I'm going to talk a little more about that in a few minutes. 
Lean management is a model that um, comes out of the auto industry. It's basically meant doing more with less. Here's what nurses have told me uh, that this looks like in reality as the CEO's attempt to run healthcare like a factory assembly line. Nurses are not receiving adequate training on units. They're being floated to and are told that they're, they should just be able to figure it out. Uh, nurses are not supported in refusing unsafe assignments. Instead, they are threatened with discipline and job loss unless they take the assignment. Emergency rooms are beyond maximum capacity with patients being boarded in the ED on gurneys and hallways, lacking privacy and a healing environment. ED nurses are not inpatient nurses and there is a difference, so that matters. Workplace violence continues to escalate in our healthcare facilities. This all results in nurses leaving the bedside in droves due to the untenable working conditions inside our hospitals. We have to ask the question, what will we do without our nurses? Consolidation and merger frenzy has been a direct result of managed care, and it is raising health care costs, not bringing them down. It is also causing our care providers to experience moral injury. Huge health care corporations are making decisions about where to open or close health care facilities and when to shut down services based on their bottom line, not on the community's health care needs, which is creating these health care deserts. Hospitals need to be to return to their roots as a community asset and not a corporate balance sheet asset. With that as the foundation on how privatization is failing patients and providers in general, the privatization of Medicare is probably the most obvious and egregious. I want to note as I begin my presentation on Medicare Advantage, a couple of things about this presentation. First, it is not meant to shame or blame anyone. It is understandable why many retirees choose a Medicare Advantage plan instead of a, tr a traditional Medicare with a Medigap or supplemental plan. It's because we're on a fixed income and we have to do what's affordable for us. The same is true for why some unions have negotiated Medicare Advantage plans for their retirees and employers have moved their retirees uh, health benefits to uh, being offered through a Medicare Advantage plan. It's about affordability as it relates to the high cost of health care in general. But it is important for us to understand and to know that Medicare Advantage is not Medicare. I want to say that again. Medicare Advantage is not Medicare. Advantage plan, Medicare Advantage is the misleading name given to the privatized portion of Medicare, the portion in which tax dollars are funneled through insurance companies. And second, the privatization of Medicare and all public health programs, please know, has been a bipartisan effort. That's why regardless of political party or ideology, when it comes to health care, it's in all of our best interests to work together to protect and advance public health and specifically to protect and save our Medicare. Medicare is becoming an endangered species with all the privatization that is happening right under our noses. That's why we need to protect Medicare, improve it and expand it. Remember, even with its flaws, Medicare desegregated hospitals has far fewer barriers to care, operates much more efficiently and is more cost effective than privatized Medicare. These headlines really give us a pretty clear picture of what the problem is when it comes to the privatization that's happening within Medicare. When Medicare was enacted back in 1965, the reason President Johnson started with those over 65 and disabled is because insurance companies didn't want to insure old and or sick people. Um, it seems over the past half a century, they've had a bit of a change of heart. Um, a doctor from the Physicians for a National Health Program, I thought, brought up a great analogy on this when she said that Willie Sutton, a bank robber from the early 1900s, was once asked, why do you rob banks? And he responded, because that's where the money is. That seems to be the pattern now within our healthcare system as well. It's where the money is. And private equity and Wall Street know it, and they are buying our healthcare system. America's health insurance companies make two and a half times 
as much per enrollee on Advantage plans as they do on their private sector plans. The healthcare marketplace is profit-driven and dysfunctional. Health is not a consumable good that fits within the economic construct of supply and demand, doesn't work that way, and we have to stop trying to fit that square peg into a round hole. A report that was issued in fall of 2023 entitled Our Payment, Their Profits by the National PNHP, Physicians for a National Health Program, found that Medicare Advantage overbills taxpayers by a minimum of $88 billion a year up to $140 billion a year. That's enough to completely wipe out the need for us to pay any Medicare Part B premium. Just think about that. So I'm going to get a little wonkish here um, and share with you some information also that uh, we have gotten from the Physicians for National Health Program, who did a very deep dive on what's happening inside of Medicare Advantage plans. One way in which the private insurance uh, makes money off of Medicare is through something called upcoding. Now, you may be wondering, what in the world is upcoding? So this shows you how the risk score gaming works, which is really how Medicare Advantage has been drawing serious uh, overpayments since its full implement implementation in 2006. So Medicare Advantage does this by submitting diagnostic codes for each patient. You don't have to worry about what those codes mean at the moment. What matters is where you see at the bottom, under traditional Medicare, this is, this is a patient that's a 76-year-old female with obesity, type 2 diabetes, major depression, congestive heart failure. And this, through the scoring process that's used for uh, risk assessment at CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, would come up with a risk score of 1.03. There is a formula that CMS uses to then determine, well, what does that 1.03 mean in dollars to be able to pay for the healthcare needs of that individual based on uh, those diagnoses that have been made? You can see here, they come up with a risk score of 1.03 and CMS would pay $9,000 for that patient. However, what happens with the Advantage companies is they basically take that baseline coding and they upcode it. They make you sicker than you actually are by changing those codes. And when they do that, suddenly the risk score jumps to a 3.63. And instead of being reimbursed $9,000, they're going to get $32,000. That is all that difference, very, a big portion of that ends up going into their profit margins, not into healthcare needs for the advantage patients. Every one tenth of a percent increase in risk score at the current enrollment levels equals $15 billion in overpayments. That is a that ends up translating into a huge amount of profits for these advantage plans. Um, and their, uh, their companies. You can see here that this coding scam is draining our Medicare fund of billions of dollars. The Kaiser Family Foundation found that Medicare Advantage has never generated savings relative to traditional Medicare. In fact, the opposite is true. And we even have factored into this billions of dollars that are being paid to in commissions for brokers to point retirees in the, um, in the way of choosing a Medicare Advantage plan as opposed to choosing traditional Medicare and with a gap or supplemental plan, which does, by the way, cost more money. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Medicare, as I said, it's never, ever generated savings. This continues to be this idea that the private sector is going to do this better. They're going to do it cheaper. They're going to increase the quality. None of that is actually happening. So it's time to move on from this nonsense. The New York Times reported, um, I believe it was last October, on the many Medicare Advantage plans that have been accused of fraud by multiple sources. You can see here, and maybe a whistleblower, by the US government themselves or the US Inspector General. 
and the complaints to CMS from seniors about false and misleading advertising and marketing of these Advantage plans has risen from around 15,500 complaints in 2020 to almost 40,000 complaints in 2021. Privatized Advantage plans are wrecking havoc with the system, particularly in rural areas, and that's just exacerbating the rural health crisis. You can see the common thread that highlights the problem. Delayed, oops, so I apologize, delayed re reimbursements, prior authorization, denial rates of 22 to 1 when compared to traditional Medicare, and administrative burdens for clinicians is real and it again, it adds complexity, it adds cost, and it takes our healthcare providers away from us as patients and instead puts them into in front of a computer um, simply to input coding for billing. This is not a good way to run a healthcare system. These simple pie charts demonstrate the waste and abuse happening within Medicare due to those Advantage plans. Traditional Medicare operates at a 2% administrative cost overhead, whereas the Advantage plans operate at at least 15% just on overhead. And then, of course, profit gets uh, factored into that as well. So you may be asking, why are so many senior citizens signing up for these Advantage plans if they're so bad? Well, traditional Medicare doesn't have a level playing field when it comes to competing with the Advantage plans. So on the surface, it appears as though the Advantage plan is the better choice. Not so much once you get trapped within it. You can see from this comparison chart where the marketing of the Advantage plans grabs people, but also notice where traditional Medicare is superior to the Advantage plan when it comes to actual access to the care that you need. It's important to also note that under utilization management, that very last column there on the bottom, 18% of the claims that are denied by these Advantage plans in 2019 would have been approved by traditional Medicare. These are tactics they use to keep the money and not have to spend it on our care. This seems almost quaint today when artificial intelligence is now writing and reviewing many of these claims. Um, and it all comes down to that bottom line. The fact of the matter is Medicare plus traditional Medicare plus a gap or a supplemental plan could run 150 to 250 a month. We have to fix that. And we've got some ideas on how we can do that in order to level the playing field and make sure that traditional Medicare ha can compete with these Advantage plans um, on cost. The financing structure within traditional Medicare works, but there are structural gaps that need fixing. Those gaps are purposeful and based on a misguided and under, misunderstanding of how healthcare works, treating it like a business that sells a consumable good. That in turn has allowed for an opening for the private sector to insert themselves because Medicare is created as an 80-20 plan. That means that Medicare covers 80% of the cost, traditional Medicare, and the patient has to cover the other 20%. So we are then forced to buy a commercial product to cover that 20% because healthcare prices are high. 20% is a high uh, percent to have to pay of any healthcare bill. And racism does play a part in the structure of Medicare from back in the 1960s, um, getting it to be an 80-20 plan. 20% 20 out of pocket for a patient is a hefty percent, but creating the plan as an 80-20 plan was the compromise to get some Southern congressional reps to support the legislation because 20% was likely to mean many Black people would forego medical care uh, because that out-of-pocket cost would be pro prohibitive for them. Of course, as healthcare costs have continued to increase at an accelerated rate, that 20% is becoming cost pro prohibited for pretty much everybody, which is why we have to, again, buy that gap or supplemental insurance to cover those costs. 
But this is why we're fighting for an improved and expanded Medicare for all, not Medicare as it currently exists. We need to fix these flaws, cover everyone for all necessary medical needs as determined by a healthcare professional. And when you do that, you save money, you improve quality, and most importantly, you save lives. And how do we go about doing that? Well, we're going to protect it, our Medicare fund, by reining in the privatizers and improve traditional Medicare. First, we sour the milk for Advantage plans. We go ahead and eliminate those overpayments. We can use that money to make traditional Medicare more cost effective for all of us. We need to ban the secret rules that these Advantage plans operate under, and we need to exclude the bad actors. If they are found to be committing fraud and abuse, they need to go. They should not be operating inside of our Medicare fund anymore. And on the flip side, we need to sweeten the juice for traditional Medicare. We need to expand the benefits that would include hearing, vision, pharmaceutical, and dentistry. We need to cap or eliminate altogether out-of-pocket expenses. And we need to ensure that there's equitable access to Medigap, the ultimate which would be to do away with the need for any kind of a Medigap plan at all. So at the Labor Campaign for Single Payer, we're working with unions, labor councils, and state federations to pass what we're calling the Level the Playing Field Resolution. This resolution, it was named by and also was drafted by a retiree council in Washington State, PASARA, Puget Sound Retirees, and it lays out how labor should view the privatization of Medicare and the position that we should take to deal with the fraud of the overpayments to these private advantage plans and how we should go about using that money to protect our Medicare fund to both save it and to improve it. With labor engaged in the negotiation of Advantage plans, we're hoping to educate leaders and members about the problems with Advantage plans and get a significant numbers of those unions, labor councils, and state federations to adopt a similar resolution. It is our hope that by doing so, we will help open up space within the House of Labor to have this very important discussion. As the Medicare for All movement works to protect me traditional Medicare, we have three goals for 2024. We want to move President Biden to be ready to sign legislation or to issue an executive order to level the playing field. We must secure Medicare Advantage reform as a part of the Biden platform and get him to talk about this issue publicly. We need to build congressional support to be ready to pass level the playing field type legislation in either the end of 2024 or 2025. It'll be important to soften the ground, making it clear what the problem is and who's causing it with our congressional representatives. And third, we want to move key institutions, retiree groups, major labor unions, health and other ally organizations to help push for either an executive order or for legislation so that we can finally have a level playing field between Advantage plans and traditional Medicare. And if we're going to level the playing field between Advantage and traditional Medicare, we need to focus on educating and activating more people around the issue, which is why we're focused on base building around events that will be taking place in July and September. Medicare birthday events. Medicare is going to have a birthday again on July 30th. We want to mobilize new grassroots supporters through Medicare birthday events, perhaps leading a lead a training at a local senior center or an activist club, table at a local farmer's market or street canvas outside a grocery store. Call people that you know. It's relational organizing. We're in labor. We know all about organizing. Doing a legislative visit with your member of Congress. Host a house party. Organize a town hall with your member of Congress and have this be the central issue that's discussed. And we're looking for other creative ideas that any of the activists out there can dream up. We want to make those come true. 
Open enrollment will be coming up in uh, October, and we're thinking maybe in September we're considering a large-scale action that highlights the ways in which corporate greed is destroying Medicare. This action would occur in conjunction with smaller distributed actions across the country. People who have signed up for these would be asked to help organize and attend the actions that are in their areas. We're going to work with local retiree networks to really engage them in this effort as well. Managed care organizations divert at least 15% of their revenues to administration and profit. That translates into billions of precious healthcare dollars that are not going to healthcare. And that's why an immediate step that we can make that will begin to improve the system for both patients and providers is to deprivatize our public health programs, uh, both on the federal as well as the state level. This would be a significant step in building the infrastructure we're going to need to administer a publicly financed system via uh, Medicare for all. Our fight for healthcare justice is directly connected to the corporatization of healthcare. As much as we need to build the system we deserve, we also need to stop the growing corporate system that is literally killing people. Delay, deny, death is no way to structure a healthcare system. It really comes down to this. In the other industrialized nations in the world who provide health care for all their citizens in some way, the unions in those countries have figured out that they can't keep their own health care benefits without everyone having health care. We know that health care is at the heart of almost every battle unions face today. So many contract disputes and campaigns are connected to health insurance. Who's going to pay what share of the premium increase? How much more are the co-payments and deductibles going to be? Employers are increasing the number of hours needed to work to qualify for coverage. Negotiations with the boss are the same for all of us. We are the only country in the world that links health care to employment. You lose your job, you lose your health care. And the bosses bludgeon us with this so-called benefit when it comes to exercising our right to withhold our labor, to go on strike, because once you're off the payroll, you're also off the employer's health insurance plan. It's time for labor to call the question. Is healthcare really something to be negotiated? Is it a benefit or is it a necessity? We can't win this at the bargaining table any longer. Our access to healthcare has become a weapon in the class warfare we're all engaged in. Our job is to make healthcare for all politically possible by moving from resolutionary politics to revolutionary politics, from transactional representation to transformational change. And the first task on the to-do list is to deprivatize our public health programs because doing so will save money and will save save lives. Aaron Dottie Roy, an Indian author and activist, beautifully sums up our ongoing work together. She says the system will collapse if we refuse to buy what they are selling, their ideas, their version of history, their wars, their weapons, their notion of inevitability. Remember this, we be many and they be few. They need us more than we need them. Another world is not only possible, she is on her way. On a quiet day, I can hear her breathing. I too can hear her breathing. She's reminding us of our common humanity. Let's stand together and fight for each other and the profiting off human suffering and demand that our elected officials do the same. If you want to strategize on how to win, how to make healthcare the human necessity it is and make it accessible to everyone, reach out to me. Here's my email address. And please, by all means, check out the Labor Campaign for Single Payers website for some really awesome resources. I want to thank you so much for attending this presentation. I sincerely hope that you found it of interest and found it to be useful. Remember, no social justice movement has ever advanced in this country without strong support from the labor movement. We must protect and improve Medicare, then expand it to everyone, no exceptions, because our access to health care shouldn't be negotiable. Si se puede. Thank you.